difference between feeling like you should be shameful and you should, you know, as a human in the world, you're going to mess up, right? You're going to make mistakes. You're going to sin. You're going to not have things that you're proud of, right? And that's part of being a human. And I think, you know, this is, a, I think, a common theme that I talk about is balance, right? Is that at some point, it's going to be helpful to have higher self-esteem to um, give yourself some grace and say, it's okay. I made a mistake. I'm human. I still can value myself. And it's not helpful to be on the other end of the spectrum, right? To beat yourself up about it, to sit and, you know, think about yourself in such a negative light. I, I probably, every single one of my clients has, has a problem with this and, and struggles with this is really low self-esteem and thinking about themselves in a really low way. Um, and because of the things that they've done, right? Because them, a lot of the times themselves, but other people have told them like, you're a bad person for this. You, you know, will never change. You are. And that's the thing that I kind of try to get across to a lot of people is, um, person centered language, right? You are not the things that you've done or that you, other people can perceive you as, um, is that you, you're more than that, right? Kind of getting back to like, we're, we're more complex than just one single black and white thing. Um, and I think it's important to use, you know, when we talk about shame and guilt, right? Guilt is more objective and I feel guilty about something that I've done and shame is an identity um, and is something that I feel and am internalizing. Um, and when it comes to guilt, guilt can be helpful, right? If we keep doing something, that we know is bad or that we know that we don't actually want to do, feeling guilty can help us change that behavior, right? If you feel bad about stealing, but you keep stealing, that guilt probably will and should lead you to not stealing anymore because you don't want you don't want to be a thief, right? You don't want that to be your identity and feel shameful about it. Um, but that, again, that's a piece of you. That's a thing that you've done versus your whole identity and everything that you are. When God gives us his law, he, he doesn't give it to drive us to despair. He gives us the law that we would be driven to Christ, that we would be driven to his son. If, if all we have in the law is a way to continually beat ourselves until we want to do nothing more than drop off the face of the earth, then really dark ways sometimes, um, you're doing it wrong. God has given us the law that we would actually be driven to look for help outside of ourselves, that we'd be uh, given a, a chance to, to receive grace. Because the, the whole point of this is that uh, it, it's not even just that, that you have to necessarily say, I am worthy of more. It's that God insists that you are, and we get to hear it from the outside in. Uh, this is where the church can step in and be a part of this. It, it can't replace everything in, in your world, nor should it, uh, but it, it, it should inform everything in your world. And there it actually is given to speak. And so I can come in as a pastor and say, you have value in Christ. You are baptized. You are worth the death of God. You are holy. You are clean. You are pure. And this can even speak then to uh, the things like shame that, that they, they just, it cuts so much deeper than guilt. Um, because guilt, you're right. It, it's, it's sort of an objective measurement of, of not being enough somewhere, um, of not fulfilling the law. And, and there we are, are um, we, we take our guilt to Jesus, who, who dies upon the cross to take it away. But this has to be more than just sort of a, an arbitrary exchange of Jesus points once a week so that we can go back to doing the same thing and try harder not to be a thief. Um, shame, though, uh, it, it, it's, it's so deep that it, it can even be stuff that's not your fault. But but for some reason, it's still how we, we tend to want to deal with this. So, so we have people with, with such low perceived self-worth uh, because of something that was done to them. These, these are people who are molested, people who are raped, people who are abused, who, who see themselves as worth, well, how they were treated. And this is where the darkest places you get are the people who are no longer ashamed of it anymore. Because shame is never actually used as a lever to try and improve yourself. It's, it's always that, that silent thing that just crushes you. The only good thing I can say about shame is that if you still have some, it's because you haven't been so broken down that you've given up on an identity at, at all, um, which is good because God has, has given us a place to take our shame. He, he again, gives us a, a new identity in him. Um, you, are, you are baptized. This is the core of your identity. You are not what was done to you. You are not what you have done. You are worth more than that. And then this is where the church gets to start to speak so that you can go back out into the world and say, you are worth what was done for you. Your, your self-esteem, uh, self 
might not be great because you're a sinner. Your self-esteem might not be great because the world doesn't want to, to value you. But what if we talked about this in terms of, of self-image? How do you see yourself? We're taught first to see ourselves in Christ. We're, we're taught first to see ourselves as one for whom God would literally crawl out of heaven and into hell to drag out, as one that he would bleed to see clean, as one that he would insist is holy no matter how ugly we see ourselves or how ugly the world would speak of us. We are worth those. So that as we go out into the world, we can look at ourselves not just according to the things we have done wrong or the things that were done to us, not just according to the standards we know we're not living up to, but but first and foremost, as one for whom our Lord wants to help and our Lord wants to, to take center stage in, in that way. Um, you want to tag in for a bit and I'll do a Bible story after that? Yeah. Um, and I think when it comes to kind of this self-image and self-esteem, one of the, the, I don't know if it's a tactic, one of the things that I talk to people about is kind of saying, hey, listen, you've told me all of these things about yourself. You've told me how terrible you feel, how bad of a person you, fe you feel like you are, how guilty you feel, um, just all the things that you say to yourself. I'm an idiot. I'm stupid. How could I do that? Why do I keep, you know, doing X, Y, and Z? Um, and I ask them, like, think about somebody that you care about your parent, your best friend, your significant other, whoever, and say, how would you feel if they said those all those, all those things about themselves to you, right? How would you feel? And they'd be like, no, you're not there. Ex, this Betty is not any of these things, right? She's great. She's good at this. She's a good mom. She's whatever. And so we were just so hard on ourselves. Um, and it, and it's not helpful. It doesn't, you know, when we, when we talk about, um, you know, positive self-image and, you know, I'm sure everybody's heard of like daily affirmations and positive self-affirmations and putting a sticky note on your mirror that says you're beautiful and you're good, right? Um, those things seem really corny, um, but they actually can be helpful um, and really help us not even get to like this, you know, narcissistic level of self-esteem and whatever, but just to get to a baseline of like, I, I am okay. I am worthy. I make mistakes. I mess up. I'm a human. I'm a sinner. Um, but I'm more than just all of my mistakes. Right. Uh, and here we, we have a place to put both of these things so we can start our day. And you say like the daily affirmations are, are corny. Um, and we, we say like, you know, we, we sort of look at our, our neighbor with a whole lot more love than we sometimes look at ourselves. And how much more then? Does the God who looks at us see us in terms of this love? It's not that he ignores our sin, but he sets aside our sin. He nails it to the cross. He takes it away from us and says, I'm not going to look at you according to any of these things that you're kicking your own butt for. Rather, I, I, I have crucified my son. So when you try and pull those down off the cross so you can suffer and hate yourself and punish yourself more for them, all you're really trying to do is pull them back off the cross where God insists they stay. You can't have those sins back. You can't beat yourself up for those anymore because God has taken them away. Uh, and so we are to remind ourselves daily that, that Christ has been crucified for our sins. We don't have to continue to punish ourselves or be punished for them. He takes them away and more. We can, we can set aside those sticky notes, the daily affirmations. They're, they're not corny. Th these are the good things that God would do through you. And more so, if God is the one working these good things through us, it's not just sort of, well, I get no credit for anything. It's that in this world, I know I'm not going to be a perfect father or a perfect pastor or a perfect friend, but I know that God is going to accomplish perfect things through me. And so even in spite of my failures, which are nailed to the cross and they're Jesus's now, I get to actually write down the positive things and say, look what God has, has done through here. Look how he has given me value, not just in taking away my sin, but in doing uh, this good work and giving me the credit before the world for it. So that when I can hate myself privately and other people can look at me and say, no, this is a good thing that he's done. God did that. And God giving me in, in the eyes of the world, this, this, this value. Because my, my value, again, it doesn't come from how I would perceive myself, how I would earn anything, but that God would take away that which is evil and reward that which is good and accomplish that which is good. And over and over again, set us up to, to be knit together as the body of Christ so that we can go out into the world and, and accomplish all these things. We, we can't simply sit there uh, focused on our own shortcomings all the time because, well, it it robs Christ of, of the crucifixion. It, it robs the Holy Spirit of, of the good works that he would do through us. And, and in doing so, all we end up doing is, is running from all of the places that there are good in the world. And, and they really are good places. And I think that, you know, when it comes to 
kind of beating ourselves up and being hard on ourselves and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that you can you can recognize things that you want to change about yourself. You can recognize, you know, I'm always late. I'm always running late. It's really annoying. It makes me stressed out. It frustrates me. It is not great for other people, right? And so you can either, you know, think about that all the time. Stress, say, oh, you know, beat yourself up about it. Say, why do I do that? Why do I keep it? Like, I just can't get it right, right? You can say that all day long. You can sit in that. You can live in it. It doesn't feel like a very helpful place to be. Or you can say, hey, listen, I'm late all the time. It is what it is right now. What can I do to change it, right? If it's something that's bothering me and I want to have it be different, I'm going to have to take action um, and do something about it. And that's where I think a lot of people get stuck is that they're just frustrated and mad about it. But most of the time, a lot of the time, there is actually something that we can change and do about it um, instead of just kind of just kind of sitting in it. Right. Because it, it's just it's just not helpful to the, to do that. And so I think if you can empower yourself and say, hey, listen, this is something that bothers me. I can do something about it. That kind of encourages other change as well, um, because it you know, the more that you recognize I do have control over X, Y, and Z, that's what I'm going to do. Um, a lot of people, it's easier and it's more of a habit to think about all the stressful things and all the things that we can't control because then we don't have to do anything about it. And that sometimes feels comfortable. Right. That's, that's called uh, sloth or, or um, I, I think it's called uh, Acacia. Is, uh, Acadia is, is the, the old sin for it. Sloth is not uh, watching too much Netflix and eating junk food. Sloth is that hopelessness that it's just more comfortable to feel numb. I, and this is what makes it so dangerous is that that numb feeling, it might not hurt, but it's sure not good. It sure doesn't build up. And really, it just sort of pulls you deeper into yourself until you disappear into it. Um, I, I think this is actually why Luther, in the small catechism, he tells us to open and close our day the same way. Um, he, he tells us, when you wake up first thing in the morning, make the sign of the cross. And it's not it's, it's not superstition. It's, it's not magic. It's, it's just, I am baptized. And so whatever I do this day, I'm going to go as somebody holy. And then he says, say the, the morning prayer, say the creed, and go joyfully to work. He says, look, focus who you are. Focus yourself on, on who you are in Christ. Focus yourself on that which God has knit you together to be. And then don't worry about it so much. We, we are the body of Christ and individually uh, members of it, which means sometimes you get to be the foot and sometimes you get to be the mouth and the eye and the hand. And sometimes you're, you're like the, the appendix that you don't feel like fits anymore. But in all of it, God has put us in a place and he's accomplishing these things through us. And, and so even when we go off feeling like failures, feeling like we're worthless, God is still accomplishing good things here. And so to, to focus on the failure, to focus on the sin, to, to find only law and refuse to look at the gospel for it, it's to divorce yourself from not only Christ, but his, his world and everything else. When we get to, to sort of start our day as Luther would, make the sign of the cross, say the morning prayer, say the creed, go to work. Don't worry about it. It's that we're fixing our eyes on a promise and then we're casting all of the rest of the stuff for, for God to sort out. It's not going to have to be your problem. It's that sort of looking into yourself over and over again until you feel numb anymore, that, that it just becomes overwhelming. You, 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 you disappear under it. I don't think this is what God would have. And that that's funny that you talk about kind of starting and ending your day the same way. That's, you know that can be included in a routine, right? I always encourage, um, and there's, you know, scientifically backed research to say, if you have a morning routine, if you wake up around the same time every day, if you do X, Y, and Z, um, exactly, it's not superstitious. It's not, you know, okay, it, if I don't wear this this uh, Bronco jersey during the game, they're gonna lose, right? It's not necessarily that. Um, it's, it's just, it, it preps yourself for knowing what to expect. Right. And if your body and your brain know, OK, we feel like we got this routine down, we got it going, we know what's to, what to expect. You can prep yourself for, for other things and just for a better day. Um, and, and the same for like a nighttime routine. Right. Like if you uh, go to bed at the same time, you, you know, whatever your screen time habits look like, um, if they're consistent and you fall asleep and can sleep, OK, then your body knows what to expect and your brain knows what to expect. Um, and, and kind of on the topic of, you know uh not beating yourself up and kind of just thinking about what you value um the term cognitive dissonance always comes up for me when it comes to uh self-esteem because a lot of the times many problems 
kind of come back to cognitive dis dissonance, which is basically your beliefs, your values, your thoughts don't match up with your actions, right? So if you say, I hate thieves, I hate people that steal, I think they ruin corporations, they ruin small businesses, whatever, and every day you go and steal from a, from a business, those two things aren't lining up, right? And so one of those needs to change, and usually the easier thing to change is your belief, right? You justify it. You're like, well, I was hungry. I, di I didn't get enough hours at work this week. I needed this whatever excuse that you give yourself. Um, you justify that behavior internally, and that's a lot easier than changing the behavior and actually making a conscious effort to physically do something different. Um, and, and that's what I see a lot of the time with, um, sometimes with people whose spirituality, um, religion, their beliefs, whatever that looks like, don't match up with their actions. And that can come from internally. Um, and it often comes from an external source, whether it's a church or a member or a family member or a friend or whoever. Um, but that's, that's a lot of what I've seen is the root cause of a lot of distress, Right. And because nobody wants to be called a hypocrite. Uh, a hypocrite is somebody who, you know, has that cognitive dissonance, who believes in one thing, but doesn't live up to that, that expectation. And it's, again, magnified in Christian circles where we have a very high standard. We have, a, in fact, perfect standard. The law given by a perfect God is perfect in sense. We're not perfect. Every single Christian is a hypocrite every single one of us. It's never referred to as a good thing in the scriptures either. But at the same time, here's the problem. If you're not a hypocrite, that means you don't actually believe in anything bigger than yourself. See, the problem with lowering our, our sort of standards, trying to justify uh, our beliefs in order, in, rather than fixing our behavior, is that every single time we adjust our beliefs down, we reduce the goodness that we can see in the world. We, we reduce our, our perceived value because we're, we're instead of saying, I should maybe try not to steal, saying stealing's just everywhere. Who cares if there's stealing in the world? Every time you, you sort of fix the ultimate good in yourself and say, there's nothing greater than me, I am not a hypocrite. All you really say is, I can't have help for anything I can't do myself. And this is going to end in a bad place. Every single Christian is a hypocrite because we actually dare to believe in something bigger than ourselves. We believe in a God who has fulfilled the law for us. No, I'm not good enough. No, not on my own, but in Christ, I am perfect. I am holy because he forgives my sins. This is what happens again when you have law and no gospel. If all you want to do is dwell on the law, you're going to have to justify yourself. And well, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We get to be the sinners that Jesus died for. We actually get to say, I'm not going to try and excuse this. I am going to try. I, I'm going to strive towards goodness. But more, I'm going to find my identity, my image, my, my value in what Christ has paid for me so that I can say, I wish I didn't have this cognitive dissonance. I wish that I could perfectly fulfill the law. But I know what to do with that gap. Rather than sort of trying to either raise up my actions until they meet the law, which I won't ever be able to accomplish, or lower the law until I can just sort of hop over the bar, I get to fill that gap with, Jesus. I get to say, he who has fulfilled the law for me, he gives me my value. He declares me righteous and holy so that I can go about my life. Uh, in Well, we, we use the word repentance, which isn't just feeling sad all the time. Uh, repentance is as contrition and hope. As we are exposed to God's law, yeah, it sometimes it, it produces contrition. It's not a perfect contrition because, well, we're sinners. And in the same way, when we're exposed to God's gospel, it produces hope. It gives in us a hope that we are more than what we can build in this world. We are what we are knit together in. Um, but but here, here, God actually would give us something to, to face the day. We, we go in light of, of his glory, his gospel. Absolutely. And I love that, you know, talking about how we, we don't lower the bar. We don't lower the standards. But again, we give ourselves grace because we are human. We're not perfect. There is no perfect standard that we can actually achieve, um, but it is about the effort, right? It's about what you're doing and what you're striving towards. I think that the kind of what I talk to clients is about is that the cool thing about life is that there's not really a finish line, um, and you can use that for any kind of recovery, right? Addiction recovery, any mental health disorder, um, anything, right? Is that there's no finish line to where you're like, okay, I'm done. I'm, I've done all the work. I'm good to go, um, and sometimes that can 
be a little stressful or be a little bit, well, how do I measure that, right? A lot of people that have perfectionist tendencies are like, okay, well, but I, that seems stressful to me. Um, but I, I try to reframe it as, um, as a really cool thing is that you can always keep growing, right? You can always keep learning um, about yourself, about whatever you're interested in, right? Within the church, whatever it is, um, you always have to not have an opportunity to do better. Um, and that I think is a helpful kind of perception and, and point of view um, and allows yourself to move past those those sins, those negative things you're doing, those um, mistakes you're making. And as long as as you're working on yourself and growing and just kind of reflecting and evaluating your values and your actions, um, I, th I think that's a pretty healthy kind of way to be. I love that, that, that we're not setting aside the law. We're, we're not running from it and just sort of curling up in a, a new thing. Uh, but instead, we're saying there's no finish line. Uh, in, in Christian talk, that, that's our baptism. Every single day, we die and rise with Christ. Every single day, the old Adam is, is drowned in your baptism. Every single day, the new man daily emerges and arises to live before God in righteousness and purity forever in our catechism. Daily, you receive grace to say, yesterday's failures are on the cross. Today's hope it, for, for whatever God would accomplish in my vocations, it's, it's him working. And so every single day, you're right. If, if you just say there's, there's no end, well, I, great. I guess we just can't wait to get to the resurrection. Uh, but the thing is, God has given you this day. And he's not given it to you so you would set aside the law and just like a dog return to its vomit, or like like an addict return to, to your vice. But rather, we strive towards his goodness, knowing that old Adam is drowned, that the sin has been atoned for, washed clean, you are pure and holy. And so as he gives you this grace, we get to actually stand before him and say, this is a day that, that you have given me and I'm, I'm going to strive for good and I'm going to hand it over at the end of it and say, fix what I, I broke. Forgive what I sinned, uh, where I sinned, and give me tomorrow, be it your will.